Police fired tear gas on Friday at a demonstration of about 10,000 people protesting in the capital Lilongwe against the cost of living and state corruption. The police said they had not been informed of the events on the ground and were unable to comment. The protest came amidst complaints by local rights organizations about the rising cost of living and the government's indifference to the plight of Malawians. Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world, with only 11% of the population connected to electricity. The demonstrators called on President Lazarus Chakwera to keep his campaign promises to create one million jobs and boost the economy. The election in 2020 of the former opposition leader who denounced the economic failure and corruption of his predecessor Peter Mutarika's regime had raised a wave of hope in the small landlocked southern African country. But this face, uh, first major demonstration since the elections shows the disillusionment of a population whose plight has been further aggravated by the COVID-19 crisis. Meanwhile, the Constitutional Court in Blantyre has dismissed the Democratic Progressive Party presidential petition nullification case with costs. Lead judge of the five-judge panel, Sylvester Calambera, delivering the ruling, accused the DPP of wanting to benefit from their own illegality after the party nominated four names for Malawi Electoral Commission commissioners instead of three, as the law prescribes. For some analysis of the social political developments in Malawi, we are now joined by Daniel Mababa, a Malawian journalist and media consultant. Daniel, very good evening to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to The Globe. And thanks for having me. Good evening. Indeed, it's an absolute pleasure, Daniel. Now, the Constitutional Court bashed the Democratic Progressive Party for uh, ostensibly deliberately avoiding the High Court and filing the elections case at the Constitutional Court uh, with the hope of uh, perhaps getting a favorable outcome. What does this ruling mean for the DPP? I think the ruling uh, means a few things. One, um, it's time the DBB did some soul searching on what uh, it really wants, because uh, I think uh, the party leadership was ill-advised in the first place uh, to go ahead with, uh, with, uh, with the case itself. Because prior to this judgment, there was another judgment by uh, a very prominent judge who ruled against the DBB particularly on some decisions they made um, in the fact that uh, the former president, Peter Mutariga, erred in the appointment of some of uh, the commissioners of the Electoral Commission instead of appointing, instead of appointing uh, two people, he went on to appoint three people from his uh, Democratic Progressive Party. And the judge uh, ruled against the TPP that the TPP the president and then president, Peter Mutariga, erred. And uh, it was really surprising that the DBB decided to pursue this case in the court. And uh, from the get-go, uh, it was quite clear that uh, uh, this was going to be outcome. And uh, so many people are not surprised with the outcome itself. Can you give us some context of what the DPP's presidential petition is all about? So the party was arguing that uh, because another judge had ruled that uh, uh, President Mutariga, uh, uh, former President Mutariga, erred in the appointment of the Electoral Commission commissioners, that in effect should mean these Electoral uh, Commissioners who presided over uh, the June 2020 election that elected uh, uh, Dr. Lazarus Chakwira then uh, was, uh, was not duly constituted uh, based on uh, the, the earlier uh, court judgment about the commissioners. And uh, the court is now saying, no, that's not the case. Uh, actually, the DPP, yes, was wrong to appoint three commissioners for its party, but it doesn't necessarily mean the Electoral Commission uh, 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 had, had, had issues to determine the the elections. The elections uh, were declared free and fair, and I think I reported here. And uh, in essence, in essence, the courts or the constitutional court is withholding the election of uh, Peter Mutariga. I mean, rather, rather, Alaza rather, sorry. Yeah. And how is the situation today in Malawi in as far as the protests are concerned? 
Well, there is pressure that's building now, I I can say. Um, you can, you're getting sense that uh, uh, the Lazarus Chakwera leadership is, uh, is now getting the sense of the pressure on the ground that's, that's mounting. Uh, there were protests in uh, Lilongwe, the capital city of Malawi, uh, on Friday. And uh, there were some considerable amount of uh, people turning up for the protests. Now, here are the dynamics. Lilongwe is the capital of Malawi and uh, a stronghold of one of the key political parties in the governing coalition. That's the Malawi Congress Party, a party uh, where President Lazarus Chakwera comes from. And there were stories around uh, whether or not the demonstrations were going to be a success being held in Nilongwe, the stronghold of the Malawi Congress Party. And what we saw on the street uh, was, um, was quite a different story. Uh, huge numbers of people, maybe in hundreds, close to thousands, uh, turned up for the, for the protests. Yes, they were marred by uh, violence, uh, running battles with the police, and uh, incidents of looting here and there. Uh, but by and large, over and over above everything, uh, I think a message is, is being sent across. The discontentment in people is growing on the ground. But on the other hand, the Jacquera leadership uh, remains adamant. It says it asks people to, to, remain, uh, to, remain, to remain patient as they are working things out to try and reduce or bring down the cost of living, which has indeed uh, skyrocketed. A recent study now says um, an average family requires somewhere around um, uh, 250,000 Malawi kwacha, from somewhere around 160,000 uh, over a year ago. And what's fueling the high cost of living in Malawi, Daniel? Well, there are a number of factors. Um, and what the government says really makes sense. Uh, I mean, there are factors that are global. You know, the coronavirus pandemic that uh, has grounded and continues to ground economies. Um, a Malawian, I mean, Malawi's economy was, 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 has been heavily affected. Um, there are issues of uh, fuel prices, the hike in fuel prices internationally. Malawi is... is is an important country. We import uh, literally almost, almost everything. And now there are issues of uh, also uh, uh, prices of uh, uh, cooking oil. But particularly fuel, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic have, have, really done, have really done the economy uh, some considerable amount of, of damage. Does the president of Malawi still enjoy great support or is that support waning? By and large, I think I would say it is waning. Um, he still enjoys, don't get me wrong, he, he still enjoys some considerable amount of goodwill from a majority of the people that elected him. Because uh, you, will, you, you will understand that the individual that, that's leading uh, this wave of uh, anti-government protest was on the forefront campaigning for Dr. Chakwera during the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I mean, there are a lot of issues around why he's left uh, 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 one of the governing, one of the parties in the governing coalition to now lead uh, this movement of anti-government protests. But I will say, I mean, without a shade of doubt, Dr. Chagula continues to enjoy some level of goodwill from people. But I will say, if things don't change in the next 12 months or so, uh, there's going to be a dent in in that goodwill. And uh, because people are now feeling like they want to see signs, positive signs of recovery, they want to see a clear roadmap of what his presidency will do to turn the economy around, to get the cost of living down, to get fuel prices down and everything else, and to create jobs. He came into power promising one million jobs uh, the last time I spoke to you, uh, I indicated that uh, we do not know how, how many jobs have been created in the first year of President Chakwera's administration. He doesn't know. The leadership doesn't know. 
They continue to, to say there are jobs being created, but not one million jobs. And uh, Malawi's population is largely over 50 percent young people, uh, most of whom are now looking to the leadership for hope. Uh, that's, that doesn't seem to be coming their way as I speak to you. Clearly, there's a general feeling of discontent on the ground. To get a sense that the government does have a clue of addressing such. There have been voices of, um, of reason, uh, the, the leadership trying to make sense of the situation. But I will say that uh, much of it has been rhetoric. No lie. Much of it has been rhetoric. Yeah. Uh, the people want to see, like I indicated, a clear roadmap of how the administration intends to to turn things around. Uh, we we are yet to see. I am yet to see that clear roadmap. Um, steps they intend to take. As I speak to you now, it's rainy season here. The the government will run to say they are running uh, a subsidy, a farm input uh, subsidy program. That was quite a huge success in the previous growing season. Malawi harvested a record, a record yield that year, and the government is banking on um, another success in that area uh, of, of agriculture or 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 uh, a crop production to try. We are basically a food economy. Once our once we have adequate food, we know things will go well for the economy. But uh, we haven't really seen the impact of uh, that bumper harvest last year uh, clearly on, on people's or inside people's homes. And so people are saying bumper harvest enough. I mean, I mean bumper harvest alone is not enough. People want to see more, uh, more jobs being created, the economy getting or industries being productive, uh, industries employing more people or more jobs being created. And those are some of the things that people are looking for. And like I said, they don't seem to be coming by easily. You know, the high cost of living is a general problem affecting just about uh, all the countries and compounded uh, by the devastation brought about by COVID-19, which obviously has affected uh, all, I mean, all countries all over the world. So uh, what is the bone of contention here? Are Malawians of the view that the government is failing to address such, uh, you know, you know, such a high cost of living? Or is it simply ineptitude of the government, as it were? I think the first part, Malawians are feeling that uh, the government is failing. Uh, the government has not admitted that. Just yesterday, President Chakwera was launching an initiative to try and uh, in, inject life into the economy to try and create jobs for young people. That initiative was launched uh, yesterday in the capital, Ilongwe. And during that event, President Chakwera um, inadvertently reacted to the people taking to the streets against failure by the administration to deliver on campaign promises. The president in his statement said it is not true that his administration is uh, uh, taking the situation with folded hands. He says his administration is working day in, day out to turn things around. But as I say, it's, it's, it's coming in piecemeals. The people are, are yet to see that in effect. People are yet to to touch what the president is actually saying. And therefore, because of that, there's a, a general sense among people that the administration is failing. But as I say, the administration uh, will not admit failure. Uh, they've given a litany of reasons why we are here. Like I indicated, they're mentioning COVID-19. Uh, there is the issue of uh, international or global trends, such as the fuel price hike internationally. Uh, there are also other reasons that the administration has put forward before, uh, due to the fact that uh, at the previous administration, the DBB administration, lied on our foreign reserve uh, standings or figures. The IMF, the IMF, uh, the IMF was. Was on, was on our neck as a country, particularly the Minister of Finance, the Reserve Bank, on why 
uh, the previous administration uh, underreported or, or, or misreported figures to the IMF to paint a rosy picture of the economy when things were actually bad. And therefore, government is coming forward with all these reasons why we are here. Uh, but I will say this again. Malawians want to see what they will do in the short term, in the short to medium term, and in the long term, to get the economy up and running again. Because as I speak to you right now, people are hopeless. You just articulated some of the reasons why the government finds itself in the position that it is in. I suppose then, in hindsight, that one of the reasons is the imposition of a tax regime that has led to the increase of the basic food prices. A case in point, the imposition of a 16.5% uh, you know, tax on well, tax that was imposed on cooking oil. One then wonders, uh, Daniel, what the rationale is uh, for imposing such huge tax uh, you know, in, in, in incentives in Malawi, uh, d despite Malawi being a, a very impoverished country. Well, you raise a very interesting matter that's still being under debate uh, here in Malawi, uh, the tax imposed on uh, uh, cooking oil. Uh, Treasury or our Minister of Finance uh, doesn't agree that uh, uh, the rise in uh, cooking oil prices is because of that 16.5% VAT uh, on cooking oil. But the Manufacturers Association, an association of uh, cooking oil manufacturers in Malawi is actually saying uh, that is the chief cause of uh, the rise in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in prices for cooking oil. And uh, some of them have increased prices by around 80%, some by 100%. We are getting the feeling that the VAT has got, uh, has got a part to play in, in the in the in the price increases, um, of course there are other factors that uh, are globally. Uh, 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 Malawi imports much of the much of the ingredients used in making cooking oil, and uh, the producers are saying yes uh, globally or where they source uh, uh, the materials, well prices have gone up, uh, but when they land in Malawi, uh, they are being met with uh, this animal VAT and hence the increase in the pricing. So there is still that debate. Uh, Treasury is saying, no, the 16% is of no effect, but producers maintaining their stance that uh, actually the 16% is to blame. All right, Daniel, lovely chatting to you. Thank you so much for your time.